please welcome Vivek Aura. start from the book and then kind of work your way through <laughs> some yeah. of it at the beginning. It was a long process apparently. Um, I've, been, I've only been involved for about um, a year or something, something like that. I filmed like uh, about this time last year-ish. Um, so it's sort of quite a quick turnaround for a film I think. But um, with Safraz who the book is based on and you know it says, it says on screen He's seen Bruce over 150 times. That's not an exaggeration. He genuinely has. Um, but what he said to me the other day was he went, I've been a fan of Springsteen for 30 years. So that only works out about five times a year. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, a long process, obviously, for Saf, because it's his life. Um, uh, you know. Um, and then uh, Grin that got involved, obviously. Um, because Saf back home is a well-respected journalist, but not a screen writer. Um, so I think he needed um, the help uh, to make his book, um, which is a wonderfully sweet book about his relationship with his father and, um, and the effect of, of Bruce Springsteen and his words on that, um, which is wonderful. And then somehow, um, what happened was actually, I'll tell you a story, and, and we're sorry um, Gorinda couldn't be here. I know some of you would have wanted Gorinda to be here. She had an emergency, um, which she had to attend to, so we're sending our um, sort of prayers to her. Um, but what happened is she got invited to uh, The Promise, which is a, I think it was a like, documentary. It's a documentary about the making of Darkness on the Edge of Town, right? And it actually um, was played a few film festivals. Yeah, right. Uh, and she got invited to that, so she invites Saf. Um, and they were both on the red carpet waiting for Bruce to come through and Bruce came to Safraz, recognised Saf and said, I read your book, it was really beautiful. And he I wasn't... He recognised him also from the front rows of like a hundred <laughs> yeah. shows, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but what was amazing is that, so he obviously said that to Saf, I wasn't there, so I don't know exactly what it was like, but pretty sure Saf lost his mind. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then Gorinda started pitching the film to him, uh, and um, and and somehow now we're here, and and, and even you know we're, we're very lucky to have this um, warmth and support that we've had in America so far. You know we we made a little British film, and then all of a sudden Sundance came calling. I remember actually I was working on a different thing with Gorinda, so we finished filming this, and then a month or two later, me and Gorinda started filming another thing. Um, in India, and we were in this place where there were huts all around. So it was like there was like a garden bit in the middle and huts all around. Um, and we each, all had, we each had our own huts, right? And I was inside my hut, and I heard her just squeal. And she was all, all the way on the other side, and um, and I ran over, and she went Sundance. I was like, yeah, exciting, exciting, exciting. Then we went to Sundance, and then uh, shit went mad, and then all of a sudden, uh, all of a sudden, uh, we're here, and. Um, and I'm very grateful um, for the American audiences because they've been very warm and receptive to us. So thank you very much for coming, coming out here. Uh, I'm curious. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious about the, the name change, for one thing. It's Javed here. Um, why, why do you think that he chose to change the name? I think, um, I think it was an idea that uh, Gurinder sort of gave uh, Saf. Um, I believe the idea that in order for him to be able to sort of slightly distance himself um, so that the character could be able to do some slight, sort of slightly different things that Saf did in his life, um, that the name was changed. Um, but yeah, I think so. It's not like that. A little bit more freedom to move things around and not feel like you're violating the truth, yeah, too. And yeah, violating yourself. Like yeah, yeah. Um, tell me about your audition uh, and what it involved. Um, 
So I, so this is my second job, not just acting job, like just in life. Um, so it's going all right. Um, uh, so I did my first job was another acting job, which is crazy to think that what I wanted to do suddenly was the first job I ever got. Um, so I'm very grateful for that. But it was another acting job, a TV job, um, and a show called Next of Kin on ITV back home. Um, with the wonderful Archie Punjabi, who you'll know here as Kalinda from The Good Wife. Um, so she's amazing. So it's amazing to work with her all of a sudden, seeing her on telly and then having her opposite me. Um, and then Grinda saw me in that, um, and I guess she thought I was all right. And she knew the editor as well. So I think she asked the editor if I was all right. Um, and then I came in for an audition, auditioned three times, and then all of a sudden I was on a film set. But uh, you said at one point you... Yes. Yeah. Yes, I know. I, we had to sing um, Born to Run in the audition. Um, which at the time I didn't know that it's like one of the most iconic songs of all time. Uh, <laughs> um, so I didn't feel the pressure um, as much, but it was, it's an odd thing to be in a room and someone goes, could you just sing this, like loads of this song? Um, but I didn't have to do a cappella. So Gurinder is like this magical woman and, and sort of force of force of nature, um, so she had a massive Bluetooth speaker, <laughs> she just blasted Born to Run really loud and shouted over it, she was like, okay, you can go now, I was like, alright, <laughs> in the day, <laughs> um, yeah, and it was a lot of stuff like that, you know, running about the streets of Luton, it's, a, it's something, running about the streets of Luton, singing Born to Run um, in that montage sequence that took about three weeks to film, um, was mad and so far away from me as a, as a person. Um, I think I am sort of pretty uh, opposite from the character in many ways, but that's what's so sort of um, refreshing about being able to play him. So you were, and you were also a huge Bruce Springsteen fan before you got involved with this, right? I was not. Uh, I, I had heard his name. Um, but I didn't, I hadn't listened to any of his music at all, like, I hadn't heard anything. Um, and so it was sort of an intimidating process, because I realised I was going to have to listen to it. Um, uh, you can see that I clearly wasn't, I wasn't the happiest, <laughs> and I didn't think I'd, I'd really like it. Um, but it was a, I had a wonderful sort of moment where, you know, I thought, I'm not going to like this, I'm not going to relate to it. I started listening, I thought, mm, I kept listening. I was like, all right, I kept listening, kept listening, and I, I just had a, it's so odd to say to a room full of people, but I had this weird sort of epiphany moment <laughs> um, in which, you know, his words um, spoke to me as a person just as they did to Javid in the film. So like, so whilst being in this film and having this epiphany moment in the film, I was also having it like as an actor, as myself. Um, and I remember going back to, trying to go back to like, uh, listen to chart music. Um, and I was like, it has no meaning. Um, <laughs> which is a weird, yeah. It was like I was having a midlife crisis at 20 years old. Um, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm curious, like, I mean, I wonder if that's one of the reasons that, uh, that she may have been drawn to you is that you could actually go through this experience and it would be a very new memory for you to then recreate for the film. I think what Gurinda said to me is that one of the reasons she picked me was that um, she, she could see me like sitting in my bedroom and writing poetry. <laughs> Which I don't know if that's a compliment <laughs> or an insult, um, but I think that's a, it's a sort of rather sweet thing, I think. And, and the poems that we see in the film are Actually. They're Safraz's actual poems from when he was a child, um, which is mental, and they're plastered all over the walls. So he said something the other week when we were out in LA. Um, he said, he said, if you take a, if you freeze frame on the film um, and you zoom in to the walls of, of, of Javid's bedroom, those are actually Safraz's poems. So if you ever want to look and, and see, you can zoom in and. Um, see a bit of his sort of teenage angst come through. Um, in, the, in the process, because obviously this film doesn't exist without Bruce approving it, 
and approving the use of the music, which he is notoriously does he notoriously doesn't do very often, even just for one song. And I mean, how many songs did you say were in here? Like seven, uh, seventeen. 17 I yeah. um, he's seen the film. Well, maybe eighteen, 18 now with the last one. Yeah, maybe. Like I 18. think they replaced something else. I think uh, it's okay. yeah. so. Um, from what I, that song wasn't in the movie when I saw it at Sundance. So the, the last one. Um, but the uh, tell me about like. What did she tell you about the? She screened it for him um, to see if he had, if he had any notes or any changes or whatever. And to, like, what was the, what was his reaction? So what she said was that she screened it for him, but sat sort of slightly behind the man, the boss, the legend himself. <laughs> um, she sat slightly behind him, and I'm, I think I think she was saying about looking at the side of his eyes to see the wrinkles by the side of his eyes to see if he was like smiling or um, or whatever, um, and. And she, she, she'd tell the story much better, but um, um, he gave her a big hug and a kiss at the end, and he said, thank you for, for looking after me so beautifully, which I think is a rather uh, wonderful thing to say. Um, uh, sort of a special, a special moment. And no changes? He didn't have any? He didn't want her to change anything? I don't think so, no. Um, it's crazy, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun that you're still sort of caught up in it. <laughs> that it's still sort of. Um, and you've have you ever met him or seen him play or? I haven't. Okay. I will at some point. <laughs> um, I didn't catch him on Broadway. Apparently, those tickets were crazy prices. I didn't check. Um, but yeah, I will. I will see him at some point. Um, just because I think it'd make a nice sort of. I don't know. It'd be a nice sort of cyclical. Thing to be able to do. What would you uh, say to him or ask him? Um, I don't know if I'd ask him anything. I'd just be like, "You're right, mate." <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know because it's. Um, I don't know. I'd just be like, "You're right." <laughs> so what you were? I mean, you, you shot this in the like actual Luton. How how bad is it? <laughs> like, how... It's not that bad. <laughs> it's. Safraz goes on about how bad it is, and, and he, he um, sort of infamously keeps saying that it's, it was voted the crappiest town in the UK by its own people. Um, and that's a phrase he likes to sort of bring up a lot. Um, but we filmed there for a good couple of weeks, and I thought it was fine. Um, but I guess I didn't live my whole life there, um, so I can't really comment. But what's nice about that is that um, I think Luton has sort of a bad rep generally, um, but it's lovely being able to put it on screen and, um, and eternalize it as a place where dreams have come true and put it in a positive light. I, I meant to ask you earlier, when you were sort of educating yourself on Springsteen's music, did you only listen to the music up until 86? Seven. Yes. If that's right. Yes. Um, so I only listened to music up to that time. So like I initially started listening to all the, the 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 films that are in the song. The songs that are in the film. What's going on? Um, the songs are in the film. Um, and then I realised if a character is obsessed with Bruce, you've got to listen to like the catalogue of music as opposed to like three songs or just. It would be odd if you know I were to come up here and. Um, and back this film and only have listened to like Born to Run, you know what I mean? Like, is I think there's more, there's more to his music and there's a he's got a wonderful catalogue of music and um, don't know what all of your favourite songs are, Bruce, or if you're fans of Bruce, but I love. What is your favourite song? Uh, growing up. Yeah, not even. Yeah. Um, it's not in the film. Uh, it's on his first. Is the first album? Yeah. Um, but I think it. I think it sort of wonderfully. Um, summarizes the film. And there are lots of bits of songs I like. I was telling you earlier that like, like you can't not feel some type of way when you hear the harmonica at the start of Thunder Road. Do you know what I mean? You cannot like, when, when you hear the start of, of, of Jungle Land, it makes you feel a type of way. You know, when you hear the start of Jackson Cage, it gets you pumped up. Um, so he's got a beautiful sort of dis discography, if you call it that. Is that the right word? Um. One of, the, one of the things that made me just absolutely obsessed with the film at Sundance, and the more I thought about it, the more ingenious it is, is the, the lyrics projected on the screen. Because they're not, it's not every lyric, it's not every word of every song, it's just those 
lyrics that you maybe hear the first time, the ones that jump out and stick in your head and make you think, oh my gosh, this is about me in this case, or this is beautiful. And you don't, you don't hear every word until you listen to it a few times. But um, it looked like some of those were actually there with you, like on the walls. And, but talk about like choreographing this and just what those nights were like. It was windy. It was, I mean, that was, was a nightmare to film. I haven't <laughs> spoken about this before, but why not? Um, <laughs> Uh, let's slag off the production. Um, <laughs> that was a nightmare. So you know the storm scene is like, and you see these words printed up. Those were like actual massive heavy duty like projectors and stuff that they had. Um, and they had lots of wind machines. And when I say lots of wind machines, I mean like wind machines that would go up from here to like the top of the ceiling. Um, and like 10 of them. And they had loads of fake leaves. Um, and let loads of fake leaves, and so they went, and then they just shove it on every time, and I was like, try to <laughs> stay still. I mean, I thought Chicago was bad in terms of wind, but I was like, going, I was going mad, um, and that was <laughs> that was really funny actually, because I kept having to go to a medical person office because I'd have like leave, bits of leaves like stuck in my eye, which is really super weird and terrible. Um, but then I remember I went back home, so that was a night shoot, so we did that until like four in the morning. Um, so I went back home, and I thought, you know what, let me just like pull my eye down, pull my eye up, just see if there's anything there. There's nothing, it looks like it's fine. And then I pulled my eye down, and there's like loads of tiny little bits of leaves, like it's stuck in my eye. And I pulled my eye up, and I was like, oh, loads of tiny little, little bits of leaves. So that's the, that's the fun of filming. <laughs> um, so I've sort of just, ruin that sort of lovely moment. Of... <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question, but we're going to have, we have a microphone right here. Uh, so if you want to ask a question, you're all still here. I'm guessing some of you might be curious about something I haven't brought up, but uh, please start lining up. Um, I'm wondering, tell me about the importance to Gurinder and to, and to you about how, I mean, if, if this was just a film aimed at Bruce Springsteen fans, it probably still do all right in this country, especially, yeah. or in the world. Uh, but but this, it's, I think it's important, I emphasize this every day of this festival when talking about this film, that it's not just for Bruce Springsteen fans. Tell me about how you, she sort of maintained, yeah. made it sort of for everybody as well as the, the Well, I sort of had a, like a bit of a mental block myself in that I thought, you know, maybe this won't be able, I don't know, maybe this won't be universal, maybe people won't see this as this because I'm a Pakistani, like I'm playing a Pakistani kid. Um, and so maybe that won't be as, I don't know, as universal. Um, I sat down with Safraz the other day and he said, why wouldn't it be? Um, I think that's a beautiful thing uh, for, him, for him to say. Um, and, and it's lovely that this is now somehow marketable. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's cool. Um, and I don't know about any of you lot sitting in there, but like, I didn't have people that looked like me on TV screens or cinema screens really growing up. Um, and when I did, I latched onto it, uh, and then looking back at that retrospectively, those weren't like nuanced portrayals of people. They were probably very good actors, but like stamped into two-dimensionalness. Um, so it's wonderful to be able to play like a relatively sort of nuanced character. Yeah. Yes. So it's, it's hard to believe that this is a period piece because I don't want to believe that, you know, I was that kid with the headphones and the Walkman. <laughs> I don't want to believe I'm that old, but um, I was wondering, with this being a period piece, I mean, obviously the environment, the uh, clothes and everything yes. is almost a char they're characters in and of themselves. So I was wondering, this being your second role, uh, did that... Um, those elements, those aspects of the film, did that really help you with your yeah. character? Can you talk about that? Super helpful. Um, so like, like it's just me here talking about this film, but like, if you know, we were to give props to everyone, there'd be like hundreds of people on stage because it is a collaborative um, effort, a collaborative thing. Um, and so the, the people that sorted out the costume for it were amazing. And the people that sorted out the, the sort of set for it were amazing in that like, I didn't have to imagine anything around me. Like I wasn't in a superhero film. I mean, it wasn't like Avengers where I had to like sit and like imagine this thing happening where I didn't really know what was happening. And like look at tennis balls and act with tennis balls. Right. Like I was acting with like all real sort of stuff. Uh, and that's um, um, props to, props to the, the people that made that happen. Yeah, it was really convincing. Thanks. Nice dude. 
Hi. Um, so obviously in the movie, your character goes through this sort of dramatic influence with Bruce Springsteen. And I was just wondering if there was any work or artist in your own life where you felt, maybe not quite so dramatically, but yeah. uh, felt as a huge influence. You know, people keep asking me this, and I'm like, I used to listen to like <laughs> Usher and Ja Rule and stuff. <laughs> So I don't know if it's quite the same, like, lyrically. Uh, <laughs> not to offend those guys, they were great. Um, but yeah, it's... Honestly, it's um, sort of less so, I guess, with music, but I think music can transport you to different places. And I remember before filming this, I was listening to loads of music that um, the words weren't at the centre of it, so, like, edm -y stuff, and, like, I don't know if any of you like Afrobeats, but Afrobeats are banging. Um, <laughs> And, and yeah, a lot of my childhood was like listening to American music. So now it's really cool that like London music is like popping off now and UK music is popping off. So I'm listening to lots of that. Um, and what sort of particularly inspires me is sort of, I guess less so music, but you know, like I was saying, you see someone that looks like a bit like yourself or that could be a version of yourself on telly. That's pretty cool. Thank you. Thank you, mate. Hi there. First, I just wanted to say congratulations. I mean, like many of them have here, I'm a huge Springsteen fan. I've only seen 50 times, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to wait my way up to zero. Seven. It's all right. Hopefully I'll catch it's that right. for one day. Yeah. But uh, as I say, the movie meant a lot to me on many levels, and I thank you for the role you played in it. Thank and you. And so I feel a little sheepish using this one as a, just a point of clarity, but who better to ask? Yeah. At the end of the movie, are you and your dad going to the concert or to college? Because I thought it was college, yeah. but that would be in Manchester, and yeah. then it seemed you were going to London. So where are you going? College. <laughs> you are going to college. Manchester. Yeah. So you would be going towards London to get some I, 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 I could not point out these. <laughs> <laughs> you're throwing me under the bus, man. Okay. Um, so you're not going to the concert. So you're not, you never get tickets to the concert back. <laughs> I never thought about that, actually. <laughs> That is a good point. Um, yeah. That's depressing, isn't it? Bring everybody down, sir. Yeah. Thank you, mate. Though. Leave him alone. Hello. Hi. Um, I was just wondering what the scenes with your parents are, or in the movie, <laughs> they're very intense and how you prepared for that or if there's anything that you took from your own life or people that you knew to kind of prepare for culture clash. So I'm very lucky in that like, are you Indian, Asian? Yeah. What are you? Indian? Um, South Indian. Yeah. What? I'm South Indian. Oh cool. Um, so yeah, it's, um, I'm very lucky in that like my parents are like super supportive and nice, so like couldn't really relate. Um, but not that the parents aren't super supportive and nice, I think there's just a, um, I think an important thing to note in the film is that there are really no bad guys. So the father in the film is not this evil villain um, who is like going to kill his son. Do you know what I mean? It's not, it's not quite to that level. It's just a difference of, just a sort of cultural uh, difference. And, and, and I had to sort of imagine that almost, um, which is a privileged thing to say, you know? Like, I, I'm doing a very first world job. This is a super first world job. Um, but you know, I'm only here able to do this because of the, the, the groundwork and foundations laid for me by uh, generations previous. Um, and so it's important for me, like in a film like this, um, to point out a few negatives, because that's what makes them human, um, and then at the end of it, uplift those people and uplift those generations um, and eternalize them on screen in a positive manner. Uh, and that's what Corvinda's character, who plays a dad in the end, is he's eternalized on screen in a positive manner. Thank you. Thank you. These are going to be our last two. I loved the movie, but I have to say there was one part that really made me so depressed, and that was the white supremacist rally, because it made me think of, oh my God, it's like over 30 years later and this is still happening. So I'm curious, you know, we had talked about the name change, and maybe that was done to, you know, distance and, and be able to give a little bit more room for things that might not have happened. So I'm curious if you know um, if, if is it Grinda, I'm saying that, yes. right? If, if she specifically wanted that scene in there because it did happen to him or because, you know, of what's happening now, just kind of make a statement about that. I, uh, 
I think you cannot set a film in 1987 in Luton um, with a working class family who is Asian and not talk about race. Like, it was just, it was part of the time period and it happened. So you see um, sort of, possibly sort of, um, you know, you see Java getting spat at, right? But stuff that happened was like, considerably worse than that. You know, people got beaten up on the streets of uh, London and around London, around the UK, just for looking like this, um, which is a rather, a rather sort of sad, um, a sad thing. And I'm here like casually talking about race because I can. Um, and, and that's because those people didn't get to talk about race because they were getting the shit kicked out of them. Um, and, and that doesn't happen to me now, and I don't deal with the racism on a day to day, but I think it's still happening, you know, um, and it's important to note that just because something doesn't happen to me doesn't mean it's not happening. Um, and, you know, and there are these feelings that uh, I'm living back home in a sort of less United Kingdom, and um, you're living here in a slightly less United States, um, which is sort of sad, um, and, you know, at a time where people seem to be continually trying to uh, create divisions. This is a little bit of unity. Yeah, and I think movies like this can help. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, I was just wondering, did you really go to New Jersey and go to Monmouth College and go to Esri Park? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to leave that to the imagination. <laughs> Have you got another one that you want to ask? <laughs> I don't want to ruin the illusion. I've ruined it now already, haven't I? Like, business trip if you could. Yeah. Yeah. I can't talk about it. I can't talk about it. I can't ruin the magic. Thank you, though. Uh, I, I slipped in here a couple of times during the screening, and I heard lots of laughing, a little bit of sniffling in more than one place. Uh, Everyone's got hay fever. A lot of, yeah, just, the pollen's, pollen's bad right now, but, um, and uh, singing, and even a few smatterings of applause after certain scenes. Thank you so much for making this movie, man, Thank seriously. You. It's amazing. Um, please give it up for that, seriously. Um, the movie, remind me when this opens, August, right? August 14th. 14. Okay, so that means you get like three months to tell everyone to go see this movie. Uh, thank you so much for coming to Chicago. Thank Seriously. You. Okay. So we're going to take him out the side. Please don't rush the stage.